Hi, I'm Dr. Craig Goodmurphy, and in this session of uh, the SHSU Ultrasound Bites segment, we're going to be looking at ultrasound guided knee injection and the general landmarking and understanding of the knee in various planes from the anterior side. Some of the objectives that we're going to be trying to accomplish during this recent clinical skills lab is the following. We're going to try to get you to understand the setup and the materials required for sterile injection or infusion of knee joints. Uh, we're going to have you identify anatomically relevant landmarks for palpation and sonographic investigation. And then we're going to have you acquire a suprapatellar injection location on an SP through an anatomical palpation and sonographic investigation. As time permits, you can look for some of those other components. Then we're going to have you perform a blind injection using a joint task trainer and then discuss some of the options and some of the differences that you see between those. Finally, we'll have you perform a very focused H&P for a patient presenting with knee pain as a chief concern. Now, this is just an image of a commercially available um, phantom that you can get. It has real bone embedded into a translucent acrylic medium that shows up uh, like it does when scanned through a, an x-ray machine, the same as it would in a real living human. And you can see that just to the right of that particular image. When you're thinking about which landmarks you're going to use to help you in identifying either a blind or an ultrasound guided injection, then you should be thinking about the following things that are listed here, and I'll leave you to read those yourself. Let's take a look at some of those on some drawings before we move ahead. We've got both lateral and medial condyles of the femur and the tibia. We're going to have the uh, trochlear groove or notch in between the two femoral condyles, and then the supracondylar components just off of that. Remember, condyles have cartilage and epicondyles are simply around or uh, above. Then we have our adductor tubercle. There's several tubercles that you'll be looking for today. One that you should try to palpate would be the uh, Gerdes tubercle or the anterolateral tubercle, which is on the anterolateral side of the tibia, and is going to be the insertion point for the IT band, which can often create that snapping sound when people have uh, problems with that. And then finally, the important one today is going to be that tibial tuberosity for any of the infrapatellar scanning. Fibular head and fibular neck are always important to find. Remember, you're going to have the common fibular nerve near that fibular neck, and you should be able to see that in scanning if you uh, take a close investigation of that. In a lateral or mid-sagittal view of a lateral uh, side, we can see some of the various joint spaces we're going to be trying to get into, and some of the bursas as well. There's that anterior uh, patella and the posterior um, condyles of both the femur and even the uh, fibula are posterior, but we're going to focus our attention on that suprapatellar bursa, which really is an extension from the joint capsule itself up under the um, patellar tendon or the quadriceps tendon and uh, anterior to the femur. In below the knee, we're going to have things like the infrapatellar bursa, which there's an anterior and a posterior view of those patella uh, infrapatellar bursa, and remember the prepatellar bursa, which is the one right just by the kneecap itself. We see a couple fat pads. Hoffa's fat pad is one that you can inject through uh, to use a blind injection site, uh, but again, it can be fairly painful to do that, but, so you may want to push a little bit of um, the option to numb the skin or uh, have a numbing agent in your solution. You also have the more important ones for today's session, which would be the prefemoral fat pad. It's just in front of the femur. Then we see the suprapatellar bursa. And then above that, you can see the suprapatellar or prepatellar fat pad, as it's sometimes called as well. And those are going to be the targets of our investigation for identifying our injection site. Now, in this still image, long axis scan of the knee, as can be seen from the inset, the probe marker is towards the patient's head. And then here on the leading edge, we have the um, patellar tendon or quadriceps tendon, which is continuous, but has the patella inserted in between. Uh, then we have the suprapatellar fat pad, 
the suprapatellar bursa, which is our target point, and this one has a bit of an effusion, and then we can see the prefemoral fat pad, which would be just above the femur itself. The patella has that uh, characteristic sound shadow that just drops off like a sound cliff right below it. Uh, so that's one way to help tell the difference with that one. When we go to the infrapatellar scan, we have the inferior portion of the patella with that same sound cliff coming off. And distally towards the receding edge of the screen, you will have your tibia. And notice how the tibial tuberosity kind of has a double hump, almost like camel humps, um, uh, as the patellar tendon inserts into that. And not everybody will be able to see the entire scan depending on the size of your patient. You may actually have to scan from one bony insertion point to another in order to see that. And you can see Hoffa's fat pad underneath. And there's even a little bit of an inflammatory response in that person's infrapatellar fat pad. Look for that characteristic patellar sound cliff and the shadow below it as you scan and you can follow that tendon all the way to its insertion point. Remember, you may see some anisotropy at these insertion points and may need to move the probe around so that you don't overinterpret that as an inflammatory response. In this particular one, what you can see is that near the um, midpoint between the patellar tendon label and the insertion point on the tibia, there's a little bit of fibrillar disruption that you can see that is kind of what uh, inflammatory response in a person would look like. However, I wouldn't overinterpret this particular one because it's fairly subtle. And then we can even see that infrapatellar bursa with a little bit of a posterior acoustic enhancement as a result of having fluid in that. Remember that fluid would be compressible along with the fat pad, but would have that posterior acoustic enhancement as a giveaway telltale sign. Nor would this fluid go away if you move the probe angle like anisotropy would. I'm Dr. Lee, Family Medicine, Sports Medicine here at SHS UConn. Going through ultrasound on the knee today, you see the machine that we're using here is the GE Logix E. That's what we have over here in the clinic using a uh, linear probe, usually a defaults to about seven, seven and a half megahertz. This is a four to 12 megahertz probe. And we actually have a real patient here today. This is Miss Helen over at SHSU Physicians. She does a lot of good work for us. So we're very thankful to have her here today. And we're gonna go ahead and start here. First thing we're gonna show you today, this is the anterior knee. And you see my probe position here. And where we're looking right now, I am just in long axis with the heel of the ultrasound probe at the superior pole of the patella, which we can see right here. Other things we can see, if you go to the top of the screen, because again, the way that I think about the ultrasound probe is the sound waves are coming down just like you're taking a slice in that direction. And what you can see is that skin, soft tissue, the layer of adipose, and then we get down into the quadriceps tendon proper, which we can see right here. And if Miss Helen will contract her knee for me right here, you can actually see there's a little bit of a fusion back here. So we're still in the knee joint, you can still see inside of the joint, even when your probe is not exactly looking at it. Relax for me. And there you can see it here. And now this is me squeezing to the side, and there's our effusion that's popped back in. So that is our long axis view of the anterior knee. And if I wanted to, I can turn to short axis. And now we can see the femur here. And again, pushing on a lateral aspect, we see that effusion pop in as that dark fluid right there. And so we'll talk later about 
lining up our injection, but this is typically where we are going to go, right here in the superior lateral pouch. So about an inch or so above the patella and an inch or so lateral. It's a little different for everybody, but again, that's why ultrasound is great. You can correlate with your depth to say, well, where I'm wanting to go is just between one centimeter and two centimeters. And so I want to go about one and a half centimeters. That's me pushing. And you see how the joint space moves there. It's one good way to be able to prep before your injection. And then we can mark the spot. And we always put it in the right place. We are now underneath the patella. So you can see patella right up here. I have the probe pointed towards the patient's head. And so that's where we are, is the very inferior pole of the patella. And you can see the patella tendon running right through the center of your screen and making a nice landing on the tibial tuberosity there. This is a nice view to where you can see the bony landmarks around here, so patella, tibia here. You see the patella tendon, and then you can see Hoffa's fat pad right underneath that patella tendon so as to make it a smoother landing. Always an important thing to remember, Hoppus fat pad tends to be one of the larger pain generators in the knee. So we try to stay away from that as much as we can. Now for this particular one, we're going to be scanning in the short axis on the infrapatellar side. That means the probe marker is right here and pointing to the right of the patient, which is away from the screen. Here is the left side of the knee. Here's the patella, and you can see if we turn the gain up a little bit, we have a sound cliff, and we can cover across that entire component, and then we're going to scan over, move this to the side here, we're going to scan over the patella and watch what happens to the probe as we scan down the knee. We go from sound shadow into the midline, and here we can start to see the various components. We're going to remove some depth. You'll see those numbers, like the 4 is going to go away if I go the right way, which is never the case the first time. I'm going to turn the gain up a bit. And we can even get rid of the uh, two focal points. So if we look the screen will get rid of one of those focal points, it goes away and it gets a little brighter, and the frame rate, if you notice, jumped up to 55 frames instead of the lower frame rate. Now we're going to move that focal point up a little bit, and now we get it into the right space, which is right near the point of interest, and it's much brighter. So again, we go from patella and sound shadow, now we start to see tendon coming across right here. And this is all tendon in transverse view. And you can see how it's kind of oblique in structure. And if we look up into here, we can see cartilage associated with the trochlear notch. So this is subpatellar view. We're looking up under it. If I stand that up straighter, you can see fanning through that trochlear notch that patella is sitting in. This is all Hoffa's fat pad underneath and tendon again at the top. As we come in to the distal attachment points, again we can see Hoffa's fat pad, and now we'll start seeing the bone of the tibia, where it's starting inserting more centrally first. See how the sides have not inserted yet. We have to go a little bit more distal, and those insertion points actually wrap around it. Look at the remodeling associated with my Osgood Schlatter's uh, here, where you can see all that little crips and cobbling that has happened from the bony reformation. Again, we're seeing the tibial tuberosity coming in, and now we're losing contact with the 
uh, tibia over here because my Osgood Schlatter's creates such a big bony prominence and then back up in short axis. We'll just quickly, as a reference point, show you the long axis again by turning the probe marker towards my head. And there you can see patellar sound cliff, tibial tuberosity, down at the distal end here, office fat pad underneath, and the femur down here. There's our tendon. And watch as I go more distal towards my feet. And instead of a double hump, you see a lot of cobblestoning as a result of that pathological condition when I was a young child. And we can even see a little bit of anisotropy here as a result of probe not getting all the sound back. But if we mobilize the probe positioning a little bit by rocking back and forth, we can see that it fills in. Well, that concludes our long axis infrapatellar scan. And now we'll go on to our medial and lateral scans for our medial and lateral meniscus. So this time we're scanning the other leg. Again, we have the head up this way, the feet down this way, and we're looking at the lateral knee. Remember, you're always going to palpate with your fingers in order to find and locate that. Here I can feel fibular head, and right there I can feel where my lateral collateral ligament is. Don't confuse that with your hamstrings tendon, which is a little more posterior. Uh, what we're going to find here is when we put our probe on in long axis again, Go. We're going to find a nice joint space, just like we did last time. And we'll see here is the femoral component, because our probe marker is towards our head. So the leading edge of our machine is over here. It's towards the head. And our receding edge of this image is towards the feet. So that means that this is the femur. And here is the joint space. And this is actually the fibular head. On this particular one, we see that hypoechoic component of the lateral collateral ligament coming all the way up, inserting into the femur right here. And then we're going to try to follow this down. And it's going to insert into the tibia a little bit further down. And you'll oftentimes see the biceps femoris tendon coming in and inserting underneath that lateral collateral ligament. And uh, what you're going to also have coming in, if you go more anteriorly, anteriorly, you'll start to see the insertion point of Gertie's tubercle, which will be for the IT band, which is quite hyperechoic right here, and then fans out to its attachment uh, on this Gertie's tubercle. All right, well, that's what we'll look at for our lateral collateral con scanning, and we'll see you next time. Okay, we're back to scan our medial meniscus. We're going to do this on the same leg. Here's our medial meniscus. Remember, by dropping your hands into the joint line, you can actually see and feel there's a little divot right there. We work around to the medial aspect, and you can feel there's a little band right there on the medial aspect. And we're going to use that physical landmarking skill in order to uh, locate our tendon sonographically even. A little bit more gel on the probe, probe marker to the head, we're going to scan in long axis. And now we're starting at the femur because we know we'll have to move down from this location to find the joint space. So we're going to start at the femur, we're going over the femur, uh, coming down by the condylar components here, and we're just starting to see some of that medial collateral ligament come in. Here's where it's attaching in all the way up. And there's two components to the medial collateral ligament, one of which is hypoechoic compared to the deeper portion, which is a little bit more hyperechoic. Here we can see the femoral condyle popping down, and here's the tibial component of the uh, medial condyle. This would be where the disc on the medial aspect is approaching in. And here this brighter component of the medial collateral ligament is actually going to be the portion that matches and connects to the medial meniscus, where the hypoechoic component will come down all the way, and you can see it inserting right here, sometimes several inches below as it comes down and inserts into the tibia. It's not as uh, simple as oftentimes you'll see in the diagrams. 
And that's a look at our medial collateral ligament. Again, you can scan through it and get a little appreciation for the hypoechoic and the more hyperechoic components of that on the medial aspect, all the way up until its attachment. Let's stop there for our medial. All right, so right now we've got everything set up for an ultrasound guided intraarticular knee joint injection. And so we have our tray here. We'll go through that here in just a minute. We have our ultrasound. It's ready to go. We'll get all of this ready before the patient comes in just so that we can ease their tension a bit. You don't really want to be waving needles around when the patient's in sight that can only raise anxiety levels. And so you see here, different people like making different concoctions. For me, typically what we do is usually any uh, combination of a steroid, what I have here, this is triamcinolone, and this is 40 milligrams per milliliter, typical dose for triamcinolone, if we're talking about an injection into a large joint like the knee, would be one to two milliliters in that. I typically use one, and that is just so that if we needed to come back at a later date, we always could come back at a later date without having to wait too long. And then usually it's just some either single anesthetic or combination thereof. Different people like different things, but uh, we have a lidocaine 1%. It comes in some more concentrations. And then we also have uh, 0.5 bupivacaine. It's also uh, known as marcaine. And this is 0.5%. Again, it comes in uh, some different strengths as well. But that's typically what we're gonna have is steroid medication and anesthetic medication. We have our small syringe here. So this one is a five milliliter syringe that you can see here. And that's why it's important to know what your volume is because either you or the people that you're working with are gonna to need to know, well, do I need a different size syringe? If I try to put more than five milliliters in this, it can hold it, but I can't ever prove exactly how much volume is really in there. So if it's more than five milliliters that you're wanting to inject, you're gonna need a different size syringe. Then you can pick your needle size. This is a 22 gauge needle. That's how we screw that on. And this is typically what the setup will look like once the fluid is drawn here. And it's typically how it's going to be until you're ready to inject. You don't want to pull the cap off your needle until you're ready to put the needle somewhere. Otherwise, it'll go somewhere you don't want it to. Other things that we have here on our prep tray we have a Band-Aid for after. A pair of gloves here. These are non-sterile gloves. Sometimes you may want sterile gloves to be there instead. Technically, this injection would just need to be a clean injection and not completely sterile. So that's usually what I'll use are the non-sterile gloves. We also have some iodine swab sticks to clean the skin. Prior to injection, this is a nice pack of three. I like to do that just so that we can definitely make sure everything is clean and ready to go. And then an alcohol prep pad, both for cleaning your medicine vials prior to puncture and drawing up the medication, but also you can use this either as a means to check where you're wanting your injection to be or to clean up the iodine after the procedure is done. We also have a skin marker here so that if you want to mark the site for injection, you're able to 
leave a mark on the skin and that can help you after you scrub it won't completely disappear so you can always go back to the same spot as long as you remain sterile with where All right, so right now, we've got everything set up for an ultrasound guided intra-articular knee joint injection. And so we have our tray here. We'll go through that here in just a minute. We have our ultrasound. It's ready to go. We'll get all of this ready before the patient comes in, just so that we can ease their tension a bit. You don't really want to be waving needles around when the patients in sight that can only raise anxiety levels. And so you see here, different people like making different concoctions. For me, typically what we do is usually any uh, combination of a steroid. What I have here, this is triamcinolone. And this is 40 milligrams per milliliter. Typical dose for triamcinolone, if we're talking about an injection into a large joint like the knee would be one to two milliliters in that. I typically use one, and that is just so that if we needed to come back at a later date, we always could come back at a later date without having to wait too long. And then usually it's just some either single anesthetic or combination thereof. Different people like different things but uh, we have a lidocaine 1%. It comes in some more concentrations. And then we also have uh, 0.5 bupivacaine. It's also uh, known as marcaine. And this is 0.5%. Again, it comes in uh, some different strengths as well. But that's typically what we're going to have is steroid medication and anesthetic medication we have our small syringe here. So this one is a five milliliter syringe that you can see here. And that's why it's important to know what your volume is because either you or the people that you're working with are gonna need to know, well, do I need a different size syringe? If I try to put more than five milliliters in this, it can hold it but I can't ever prove exactly how much volume is really in there. So if it's more than five milliliters that you're wanting to inject, you're going to need a different size syringe. Then you can pick your needle size. This is a 22 gauge needle. That's how we screw that on. And this is typically what the setup will look like once the fluid is drawn here. And it's typically how it's going to be until you're ready to inject. You don't want to pull the cap off your needle until you're ready to put the needle somewhere. Otherwise, it'll go somewhere you don't want it to. Other things that we have here on our prep tray, we have a Band-Aid for after. Pair of gloves here, these are non-sterile gloves. Sometimes you may want sterile gloves to be there instead. Technically this injection would just need to be a clean injection and not completely sterile. So that's usually what I'll use are the non-sterile gloves. We also have some iodine swab sticks to clean the skin prior to injection. This is a nice pack of three, I like to do that just so that we can definitely make sure everything is clean and ready to go. And then an alcohol prep pad, both for cleaning your medicine vials prior to puncture and drawing up the medication, but also you can use this either as a means to check where you're wanting your injection to be or to clean up the iodine after the procedure is done we also have a skin marker here so that if you want to mark the site for injection, 
you're able to leave a mark on the skin and that can help you after you scrub it won't completely disappear so you can always go back to the same spot as long as you remain sterile with where well that's it for this time we'll see you next time on ultrasound bites i'm dr craig goodmurphy have a great scanning day